Half a day, students. I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. Welcome to PBS University. Our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education put this episode together with some fun and exciting learning material to help you keep up with your studies. So thank you for joining us on another learning adventure. Sidzu Usmasi and have a great listen. Half a day, and welcome to this series about archaeology and ancient sites of the Mariana Islands. These episodes introduce the most current facts and findings from archaeological sites toward clarifying what we know versus what we do not know about how people lived in the islands throughout the last thousands of years. This knowledge can support diverse new discussions, perspectives, and interpretations. I hope that you like this series, and I look forward to learning more together. In nearly every part of the world, government laws and agencies have been designed for protecting and preserving ancient sites and the knowledge that can be gained from those sites. In the Mariana Islands, the policies and procedures have developed somewhat differently for the Historic Preservation Office in Guam, apart from the Historic Preservation Office in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Both entities, however, share much in common in terms of working in compatibility with the United States government laws and guidance from the United States Department of the Interior and the National Park Service. Furthermore, they share the same goals of preserving and protecting cultural heritage sites and knowledge in the broadest sense. Within this framework, the notion of historic preservation applies to any place or any information about a place or a theme of historical significance, including not only traditional archaeological sites, but also historical buildings and constructions, as well as cultural places and landscapes that are known through family histories, traditional knowledge, and other practices. Given this broad scope of historic preservation, several tasks are involved in terms of identifying the sites and the resources, ensuring professional standards of work, and linking with concerns of public access, research, and education. I asked the Guam State Historic Preservation Officer, Patrick Luhan, if he please could share about his work and responsibilities. The issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis here at the Historic Preservation Office is such a broad scope. Anywhere from the permitting process, from the local standpoint, being an integral part of all the building permits, uh, whether it's grading and clearing, anything that DPW has permit-wise, uh, we're a big part of that process. And then you know, on the federal side as well, with the National Historic Preservation Act, federal guidelines, uh, in particular what's most commonly known as Section 106, any federal funds that have been allocated has to be reviewed by our office for any type of historical or architectural or archaeological uh, impacts. That's a broad process that we have the entire island to look after. And it's not just the land, it, it includes the sea, it includes the ocean part of any type of marine archaeology. And needless to say, it's a big task for our office to pretty much be stewards of, of our land and our sea when it comes to history, any type of history. And then we have, we are the caretakers of the National Register of Historic Places and the Guam Register of Historic Places. That in and of itself is a big program. And then we talk about other items dealing with history, Guam history in, in and of itself, right? Working with stakeholders such as UOG, such as Mark, such as the archaeological firms. The Guam Museum is a big stakeholder, Guam Preservation Trust, Kaha, Decolonization, Chamorro Affairs, you name it. We are partners with them. What I had spoken in testifying to the Guam legislature, as you know, we have it's a small office with a huge impact, a really big impact on, on our island. So we take it, you know, near and dear 
as small as we are, we understand the magnitude and the impact that we have on the island, and, and we try to do our best in regards to watching over the complexity of our lands. In nature, what we do is a research-intensive mission, and so it, it takes some time to go back and look at old maps. Part of the day-to-day reviews is looking at all the different historical maps on Guam, looking at all historical archaeological surveys on Guam. When were they done? What were the methodologies that were conducted? Is it sufficient today? What are we learning? The human remains and the ancient tomorrows that were found in what is today Camp Blas, that pretty much changed the dynamics of how we've been operating and doing business, especially on the northern plateau of Guam. So it's ever-evolving, consistently learning. Archaeology on Guam, the historic preservation movement on Guam is still fairly young, just like the government itself. The government of Guam itself, it's still fairly a young government, talking just, you know, several decades old. What was surveyed back in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, into the 2000s, we're still learning about our, our history, right? And, and it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal field to be in, working with different types of archaeologists and still continuing to gather data to learn from our history, to learn from our ancient people. And more recently, historical context, right? Leading back to World War II, you know, in fact, the, the Japanese government, again, working with different governments, right? The Korean government, the Japanese government, trying to find their, their people from World War II. And then, you know, working with the military, just the the sure federal guidelines and the statutes where we have to work closely with the military on, on what they're doing on their properties. Let's say a, a homeowner comes through for to build a house. That's through the permitting process from, from DPW. And we are one of the government agencies that, that have to sign off. A permit comes through. We look at the plans. What are, what are they planning to build? This could be a private single house dwelling, or it could be a giant hotel uh, proposal. So we look at all of those. They bring in the plans. We take a look. We look at what is called the APE, the area of potential effect. We look, like I mentioned, the maps, you know, 1914, 1944, 18, whatever, all the, the different types of maps. And then we look at what has been found if there has been studies there and look at the probabilities, right? There's high probabilities. We know the coastal lines are high, high probabilities of kind of getting any type of cultural resources. Now we're finding out even more so in the, on the Northern Plateau that there's more and more that were there. With the old thinking of, oh no, there's nothing there because of the limestone foundation of, of the Northern Plateau. It takes a typical permit if we deem that there's really nothing low to no risk of finding something. It, it, it's probably a, a good five-day process. If we kind of flag something that we feel that there's potentially something there, you know, and there's more archaeology uh, research that need is required, you know, that can take uh, up to 30 days. As the probability goes higher, then we work with the, the parties to make sure that what could possibly be there is taken care of. And there's so many different steps and ways of going around the the protection of resources. Again, when it comes to human remains, that takes our reviews and our attention to a whole different level with the mindset and the principle of of preservation in place. I think uh, some of us have heard that term before, of preservation in place, and working with the landowner, firm, uh, whoever is involved in that project, trying to give the most utmost respect for those who have been buried there in the past and leaving them as as they, they have been at that time. So that's the local part. Uh, very similar also to the federal side. Every federal monies that have been allocated has to be reviewed. So it doesn't even matter. Even, even let's say, GCC gets federal grants, UOG gets federal grants, GPA gets federal grants, all these government agencies get federal grants, they have to go through a Section 106 process too. Even though they're a government entity, or even if a nonprofit gets a federal grant, they have to go through the Section 106 process. The local government sometimes don't don't remember that or don't understand that they still have to go through that process for the mere fact that it's federally funded. Here's another example. The federal government 
let's say Anderson Air Force Base has federal monies to paint buildings. So they have to write a letter to us. And normally if that building is not of historic value, it's not on the register, we just sign off. Okay, we concur, go paint your building. Sometimes we get into programmatic agreements where a federal agency says, okay, everything that requires changing light bulbs or changing toilet seats, whatever, and it's not in a historic structure, you don't have to send us a section 106 review. That kind of streamlines and helps the paperwork coming through us. What we're concerned is ground disturbance and then any type of historic structures, you know, World War II structures, because you want to keep the integrity, the historic integrity into these historic structures. We look at the Pearl Harbor buildings that have these bullet holes on the side. They're not going to patch that up. That's by design. There's a reason. They want to continue to tell the story of the wall. So when you pass by up to today, you have these giant bullet holes in, in the in the buildings throughout Pearl Harbor and Hickam. Same here that we do on Guam with historic structures. We're trying to keep the integrity of that structure in place. That's a good question. A lot of people want to co- go in and visit these sites. It really boils down to the land ownership and the privacy and protection of it, right? If there's historic sites on private property, we have to work with the private landowner to have access, myself included. I can't just walk in and visit these sites as as I please. On federal property, whether it's on a naval station, whether it's on Anderson, there's a process that each installation has for visitation programs that they put in a request to go and visit. I'm actually currently working on a program it's a collaboration between the Shippo's office, Joint Region Marianas, and the National Park Service to develop a consistent, clear, transparent visitors program for one of the Laddie sets on Naval Magazine. And we've identified the site, we've identified the access potential. Now it's a matter of just building upon that. That area of Naval Magazine that's well protected for security purposes, obviously, from a defense side but it's also protected a lot of cultural sites. Everyone knows it's not easy to get in there. A lot of people in Guam, especially the local Chumos, barely any of them have been able to access that area and, and to just go back in time because that's a, how, it, how it feels. You're going back in time when, when you go to, to Naval Magazine. We're trying to provide clearer and, and smoother access uh, for sites like that, you know, for, for the general public. In all essence, it it's really boils down to the land ownership. Obviously, if it's a Gulf Guam property and it's open to the public, then, you know, there's easier access to that. But if you go to Gotnia or whatever, there's if a family owns it, then you have to have access uh, through the family. And we can help. We basically know who owns what on island and we can facilitate that. Definitely, it boils down to the land ownership for, as far as access is concerned. A good overall collective picture of any type of historic site is the stories. There's always stories behind something, whether it's a lunch, whether it's a laddie set. The tomorrow culture has been a verbal culture for generations, hundreds of years until just this this past century, where where the tomorrow people finally started writing their own history. With what we do from an archaeological standpoint, there's that scientific portion of archaeology and the methodologies of archaeology. There's also the historic context. What we're trying to do is incorporate oral history. How can we incorporate oral history into these studies, into these, these surveys? Those are important information that could go towards not just what's being found 10 centimeters down, 20 centimeters down, right? And, and looking at the context from the land. What about above the land? What's the story, especially in modern time? What did my grandmother say to me? And what did my great grandmother tell me about this, this area? Hey, even now with my little cul-de-sac in Manila, I'm going to start writing something up about everybody that lives in there, you know, that could be something of, of historic value something ever happens in that area later down the line. What year did did this family start living there? And what year did this family start living there? And who was the family? And how many landowners were there and and whatnot? How can we incorporate these types of information and stories into what has traditionally been an archaeology-based story in every site? 
Um, so that's what we're also trying to incorporate into the final document of what we store here in the office. So how can they do it? Good question. Uh, we have a historian here on staff, Tony Ramirez, Malia. She can really you know, sit down and, and gather that information. Give us a call or email us. Whatever information of, of significant value, storytelling, what have you, you know, especially if, if you own a property or you live on a property that is, that you know of that is of historic in nature, then we'd like to hear that information from you and add more value to what we already have on file. Our office is a source of information. Having access to that, it's supposed to be open to the public. We serve the public. We are here to provide that information. Now, sometimes it's sensitive information and we have to be careful because there, there are such things as looting, you know, and, and as protectors of these cultural resources, we have to be very careful as far as who and how the information is shared. With that being said, we are uh, an open source of information. Mostly the archaeological firms are the ones that come in and do research. But uh, as of late, we've had some interested uh, citizens of the island just interested in whether it's EPAO archaeology, the whole Tumon archaeology, or up at, you know, the northern beach side. And, and those are good because, because we want to work with these people who care. You know, we want to be partners with them, right? They, they want to good, do good things for our island. And we are we are just one office. And the more that we have the public involved, the more that we have the public educated and understand what we're doing, I think that, that goes a long way. And to partner with them, because really they're the ones that are going out and, you know, and looking at these things and, and wanting to protect them and, you know, understanding what the laws say. What, what does the, the Guam laws say in regards to artifact ownership and, and the process and where does our office fit in? Where does the Guam Museum fit in? So a lot of it is, is just that information sharing. How do we care for it? What do we do? Who really owns it? The more people from the community that can come out, get involved, partner with us, get informed, it only makes us stronger. It makes our, our island stronger as far as protecting what, what we have left um, with what our ancestors has, have left us behind. When we talk about Guam history, we've done a fairly good job of studying pre Ladi period and Ladi period, World War II period, um, Spanish era. The threshold for the National Register is 50 years. And I think we always forget that 50 years ago was 1972. And so now we got to start looking into that's pretty much modern history. Right now, looking into architecture, the, the the buildings that have been built in the 60s and 70s, how significant are they? How historical are they? That's one thing I'm looking at moving forward with our offices. Now let's start focusing. How can we protect these for our future generation? How can we protect the 1970 structure? You know, and 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 educating the owners of these structures you know, to keep that historic integrity for future generations to come. Though we've been working in the past, I also want to look into the future and say, how do we, what what our hands of today and, and just, you know, a generation ago has built, you know, and how can we keep that going on, you know, as time goes on. During an online classroom meeting, the participants posed a few extra comments and questions about the Historic Preservation Office in Guam. We like to use the word stewardship now in terms of caretaking our, for, for our lands, right? And, and we, as an office, from an archaeological or cultural standpoint, we have that responsibility to our people and to the future being good stewards, right, and making sure that whatever is being developed or built or what have you has that respect of our ancestors of the past and not necessarily hundreds of years, but even more recently in, you know, World War II or even more recent history, knowing what has happened from an archaeological standpoint and what this office is trying to evolve into more is a broader sense of what a specific site and the story it tells, evolving beyond 
your what they call the APE or the area of potential effect, right? And and telling a, a broader story. You know, once upon a time there was no roads, there were no walls, there were no military bases on Guam. Where can we document and tell stories of how our ancestors lived? There's a lot of careers and 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 positions out there that is black and white, right? And you just you just go either the black side or the white side. But this one, the problem sets are are so unique. The problem sets are 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 so vast and how to come up with solutions that fits within the confines of statute that's really what drives the daily complex of of the position no day is the same day that discussion has has arose in the last couple of years and that's where it should be that's that's how it should be right we should have our own cultural monitors not not outsiders who don't know the land it's very painful sometimes that we get off island monitors right to to come in and work on our lands and they don't they don't know you know the lay of it and and the history and all of that stuff and they're not used to our jungles and what not so absolutely i'm in, i'm in total support of that now how to develop it and how to sustain it that would be the next phase and you know in the next question into into something uh where that could be a very established piece of the process issues of historic preservation are diverse and complex not only in guam but also in the commonwealth of the northern mariana islands and anywhere with a historic preservation office several different aspects are involved in the kinds of sites and other resources that exist in the perspectives that are important for understanding and appreciating these places and in the methodologies that can be applied for preserving and protecting the sites and the information about these sites for these reasons no single formula can be applied successfully in every instance of trying to preserve or protect a site or other resource instead a long-term program in historic preservation can be more productive when embracing the diversity in the kinds of sites and resources, in the perspectives of the people and the stakeholders who care about these places, and in the methodologies that can be relevant. What aspects of historic preservation have you encountered? What parts have been successful or effective? What parts could be improved? How would you suggest to develop a program of historic preservation in a place that is important for you? Thank you for joining us in learning about archaeology and ancient sites of the Mariana Islands. If you would like to access more details, then I encourage you to visit in person or online at the Micronesian Area Research Center of the University of Guam or at the many other libraries, museums, and offices that work with historic preservation, archaeology, and ancient history. Thank you again for watching this program. I hope that you will continue to explore and discover more. How can archaeology reveal landscape evolution? Here is a short answer with an example spanning a few thousands of years at the site of Unaibaput in Saipan of the Mariana Islands. Stonework ruins are visible on the surface today, and deep excavations showed several layers extending back at least as early as 1500 BC when people first lived in this region. When viewed in chronological order, these layers illustrated what happened during each measured time period of the changing sea level coastal ecology, shapes of landforms, placement of houses, forms and styles of pottery and other artifacts, and the range of foods in the local diet. In total, the evidence demonstrated a unified natural and cultural history of this place. The findings were consistent with my research at other sites of the Mariana Islands, thereby establishing a basic framework for addressing a broad range of questions.
What are your thoughts about this framework? What questions are most interesting for you to explore more? I'm Josh Tenorio, your Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for being with us today and for taking the time to continue your learning with PBS University. I also want to thank your teachers and support staff at DOE and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to you, our students. Siduz Maasi, and we hope that you enjoy this PBS University instruction.